right? Okay, <laughs> there we go. Now that we're back uh, back from pharmaceuticals, um, the the real long and the short of it is know what you're getting first. So deep root fertilizer is a bit of a misnomer. And part of that is because most fertilizer, most roots aren't that deep. Most roots actually only exist in the in the top 18 inches of the soil. So, you know, once you get beyond 18 inches, there's no roots there. Uh, most of the time there's, there are anomalies, but that's typically not the case. Um, and some of you would know roots love to sit at the top and that's in really compacted soil because they can't breathe. Um, deep root fertilizer uh, is when you take a, a machine and you plunge it into the soil and it it shoots out uh, water or nutrients or whatever, uh, the water that comes with that fertilizer usually is pretty good um, just because you're just watering your tree. In some cases, I've even said that that's really the more important thing. But then you want to know what is the actual fertilizer? Is it a nitrogen fertilizer? Is it a phosphate-based fertilizer? Is it a, a bioavailable fertilizer like a mycorrhizal? what's in it? And then when the person says, well, this is what's in it. Why is this good for my tree? Oftentimes we don't take things from physicians without saying, why is this, is this going to be okay for me? Is this going to make me sick? It's the same thing. That's where the snake oil comes in. Are you buying something from somebody who doesn't know what they're selling you? And do they know why they're selling it to you? Right? What's the diagnosis on the tree? Is, is the tree declining? Yes. Does it, could it use nutrients? Maybe. Is the environment devoid in nitrogen? Well, we never did a test. Well, I don't know a doctor that's diagnosed cancer without a blood test. I mean, maybe, I mean, it depends on the cancer, but the, the idea being, you'd probably ask a couple questions if you went and talked to your doctor about your knee and then he was like, well, you need to take this stuff, right? Oh, do we know what the knee, what's in the knee? Do we know if it's bone cancer? Do we know if it's a, if it's a sprained knee? Look at it a little bit, right? Do you take some x-rays? That's where the snake oil comes in. Right. So if you're buying that deep root fertilizer, what's the diagnosis on the tree? What's the tree? What's the diagnosis? And then what's the app? What's the fertilizer? What's the application? Oh, we're going to do 30 pounds of nitrogen fertilizer every every week for the next 16 weeks. Uh, it's probably going to kill the tree. Right. Or we're going to bring in mulch and then we're going to use sugar and we're going to use a little bit of, you know, fish, fish guts or whatever. OK, maybe that has efficacy. I don't know. Make sure you do tests and it helps to do tests before and after. Most people don't want to pay for that right now. Um, and I get it, but uh, it's it's worth knowing. Uh, <sighs> treatment without diagnosis is malpractice. Mm. Back to you, Kim. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Um, <clears throat> so another question here from Sri T. And uh, they are asking that they have heard the spotted lantern, sorry, the spotted lantern fly is in Ontario now. Should fruit tree owners be worried? Okay, so I have heard this too, but I haven't seen anything official. So just, you know, take that with a grain of salt. Um, yes, you absolutely should be worried. You absolutely, spotted lantern fly, if you have a fruit tree, if you have, um, if you reside in Ontario, you should be concerned about that. You should just just generally be concerned about invasives. I mean, that's a bit of a blanket statement, but uh, spotted lanternfly has a wide host band, and uh, it it will affect our fruit industry and it will affect your homes. Um, so educate yourself on it. A uh, great place to go is the Invasive Species Center. Beautiful, nice and concise answer there, Kyle. And I love that sort of general statement of like, yes, yes, you should be concerned. Everyone should be concerned about invasives. And I think it's like the same way that you mean it when Burlington Green is like, yeah, everybody should be concerned about climate change. Um, but I like that you followed up immediately with like, and then here's the things you do about it. The concern yeah. like leads to something. And I think that's, generally all of our intention that concern just for the sake of worry generally is not as helpful um well put. yeah excellent answer and another one a separate question from anita is asking how to spray an apple tree in an organic way okay so i guess the big question is what is the spray and what are you spraying for this is once again those diagnosis questions um are you spraying bugs like aphids or are you spraying to control fire blight? 
right? Which you actually can't spray for. There's nothing that you can do. Um, are you spraying to control Eastern tent caterpillar, which that you can do that. That is organic. There is, but it depends on, or there are a lot of organic treatments, uh, but it really depends on what you want to do. So uh, can you give us a little bit more insight there, Anita? There's a message in the chat that just says bugs. Bugs. Okay. Um, so bugs, generally speaking, um, if you're talking about a broadband organic pesticide, you're talking about horticultural oil, which is mineral oil or soap. Um, that will, that will kill every bug that it comes in contact with. It will not have, which is good and bad, right? That will kill every bug that it will come in contact with. It will kill monarch butterflies. It comes in contact with them. It will kill darner, uh, Eastern darner, uh, uh, dragonflies, if it comes in contact, it will kill aphids, it will kill ladybugs, it will kill everything. It will kill everything, your good spiders and your bad spiders, your good bees and your 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 hornets. Um, so keep that in mind, right? It, you will nuke it. Um, if it's if you're trying to control a tent caterpillar, then a good organic treatment is 4A48B, which is Bacillus thuringiensis. It's what we use to control LDD, formerly known as gypsy moth. Um, because caterpillars will eat it and then it will go inside of their guts and then they'll die and it only affects caterpillars and it only affects caterpillars when they're caterpillars not when they're butterflies and so that is also an, an organic thing so soap mineral oil and uh, bacillus thuringiensis remember like i said make sure you diagnose what your problem is before you start just going shooting and killing everything in your garden uh, because that can have some serious consequences including worse pest infestations later Awesome. Thank you so much. As usual, very intricate and balanced answers. Thank you so much. And I think we have time for um, maybe two more questions. So um, I'll, uh, the first one here, which just I think is, a, it's, it just seems like a very poignant question to me. And it's from Robin, who I don't believe is here tonight, but uh, they're asking, I have a very large invasive maple tree in my yard. The canopy lets in no light and the keys go everywhere. Not much else can grow under it. Should I be removing it because it's invasive or leaving it? Is there anything I can do to address the invasiveness? Oh, what a, what a complicated question. <laughs> um, especially when it comes to the invasive maples, which I imagine are Norway's. Norway's are really problematic. Um, Manitoba maples, not so much, you know, people will call them invasive, but they're not, they're not introduced from another continent. They're an, a species introduced from another ecosystem quite close to here. Um, man, it's in the name, Manitoba maple. Um, but if we're talking about Norway maples, that is a complicated question. What I would suggest, plan succession, plan and plant successional species now. Don't cut it down and then let a hole get into the canopy because what you'll do if that happens is you will actually cultivate buckthorn. So you're going to have another invasive species problem on your hands and buckthorn is way more difficult to manage than the Norway maples. And so we want to succeed. We want to plan for a successional layer in our forests and Norway maples are terrible for shading everything out. They do, from what I've heard, provide some sort of minute ecological benefit. Um, however, we don't want them established in our forests and I myself know, uh, especially as some of you know, I've been working on the woodlot management strategy for the city of Burlington. We have some forests um, on in Hidden Valley, for example, that are full of Norway maple. It's like, oh man, how do we manage this? Well, unfortunately it's Norway maple up top, buckthorn in the middle, and then goutweed on the bottom. No native species in some of these patches. Um, and so if you're gonna manage invasive species, it's not just a stroke of a pen or the stroke of a saw as it were, uh, you need to plan to manage it long term. And the first step is planning, not just being reactionary and saying, this is an invasive tree and cutting it down because then you're going to have lots of other problems. Start with what you want to replace it with and get those trees planted when they're small. It's way better to plant smaller trees than it is to plant bigger trees. And we can go into that if somebody wants to ask if we have enough time, uh, but plant small trees and a number of them, like I was saying to Carl earlier, uh, because some of them might might establish, some of them might not. And if you spend, don't spend a thousand bucks on one tree that takes a giant hole and is really hard to get established. Don't do that. Spend 200 bucks 
on a bunch of really small trees, get the ones that you want established, established, and then plan to remove the invasive maple at the back of your yard, or even do it in stages, right? Try to try to mimic the natural process. Um, uh, you know, that's not for everybody, but it's a consideration. Thank you. Very wise, very wise. Um, and I'll just say, uh, if you want to do like the follow up and just answer, because I think you piqued everyone's curiosity in the terms of planting small ones as opposed to larger ones. And then I'll maybe throw uh, one last question at you, depending on how much time we have left. Sure. Yeah. So, um, you know, planting a, a large tree, this is great. Um, so if this is the, oh man, every time, come on now. There we go. If this is the center line of the, the earth, is not super straight. Um, planting these ball and burlap trees that have the big root balls, right? Versus planting um, a small one like this that comes in a, a container. First of all, this tree has lost 95% of its root system over its life uh, in the process of transplantation. If it's been grown in a field, those roots will go all over the place and losing those roots stresses the tree out and it will be stunted for the rest of its life. Whereas you plant a tree, that one on the right, the small one, in 10 years, this one is gonna take all this time to recover. This one on the other hand, doesn't lose, it never loses 95% of its root system. So it gets way more established. It's easier to get established. It starts growing faster and it grows exponentially faster. It will surpass the large one on the left. We talk about this in the city because the large ones on the left are really what we, only what we can plant, partly because the smaller ones often become victim to vandalism. People will complain, they want bigger trees. You plant a giant tree, like a physically a giant tree, whether it's a large growing species or a small one, you're, that tree is always gonna be stressed and you're often gonna have problems. We try and go with the middle ground here with those ball and burlap where it's still super stressed, but it's big enough that it, you know, a kid can't rip it in half. Um, but at the same time, small enough that it's not super, super stressed. Uh, but I would say five gallon, what we give away at our tree giveaway, I strongly suggest it. Also want to do just a quick shout out. Our friends at Conservation Halton um, have been working with uh, with us in and Parks, uh, Parks Design and Construction to do an invasive species event on uh, October 14th at Hidden Valley Park. So just a, a note, just because I had mentioned Hidden Valley earlier, for those interested in um, helping with uh, the invasive species there, there's something going on. Um, and uh, I think we got time if it works for you, Kale, for one more question. Awesome. And thank you for the shout out of that invasive species removal event. I will, I'm sure we'll share that on our Burlington Green platform since we have some more information about it. And if anyone hasn't done it themselves, invasive species removal is just incredibly satisfying. Um, so satisfying. Immediately rewarding, awesome things. Um, yeah, Salma thinks it's great too. Okay, so a uh, question here from Elma Miller. Um, when a new tree is planted on the street by the city, how do we find out what it is and how to care for it? Great question. Um, so we, you're, <laughs> typically there should be a little tag if it's a newly planted tree. The, the planters sometimes leave the tags on. Um, and then I would suggest everybody out there who, who cares uh, gets the book Trees in Canada by John Farrar. Um, I want to make sure it's John. Yeah, John Farrar. Um, it's an excellent book and it will help to give you the, this, the tools to actually learn how to identify tree species. We have a public facing inventory too, I believe, but I want to just double check that before I say that. Uh, Yeah, on our uh, on our city owned trees portal, I think this is. I'm pretty sure this is public, and then you can actually look it up yourself. I would like to have a little bit more of a user friendly one, um, but uh, but it's still rather helpful. Um, perfect. I'm going to just share that as well. So I would encourage you to learn how to identify the trees yourself. So looking at the form of the tree, looking at the leaf, what kind of fruits it has, um, and also the kind of environment we planted it in too. Um, 
so if it's being planted street side, generally it's going to be a moderately hardy tree. We don't plant sensitive trees on busy roads, like say New Street. Uh, we try to plant hardier ones. Um, but uh, I'm going to include that in there. So there's your uh, there's your GIS. So you can actually look up your uh, your home and see what tree is uh, planted in front of your house. Now, also keep in mind that you see the data uh, was updated in May. I think it'll be updated later. That's a GIS piece. So if your tree isn't there yet because it was planted this year, don't fret. They do update it. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so navigate burlington.ca and trees in Canada by John Farrar. Amazing. And I'm going to try and just squeeze in one last question because uh, we have it from Peter who is present here with us. And did I just jump in? You already answered the last question, right? I'm not skipping anything. Yes, we're okay. good. So, um, so Peter's asking, uh, interested in hearing your thoughts about bracing. So he says, I have a very large linden in my front yard beside his birch from previous question. And it has been recommended to brace about six feet above where the main stem splits to two major upright stem stems. And just wants to hear your thoughts about that. Okay. Um, so cabling and bracing are, are techniques that are really helpful uh, when you have large mature trees. Uh, that, that birch that I was just explaining earlier next to my house, I have that cabled. Now, it's important to note the, the dynamics of cabling are really complicated and absolutely fascinating and not something we can really get into right now. Um, that's a really in-depth topic, which I have a lot of time for. So if anybody wants, to, <laughs> uh, wants me to do an hour-long webinar on cabling, let me know um, or let Amy know and then we can, you know, uh, do that. But um, really at the at the side of it, bracing, I am all for preserving trees as much as possible. And so the idea with bracing is it's a tree preservation method to stop it splitting. If the tree is healthy and solid and doesn't have a lot of decay or a large cavity, uh, bracing is a very effective method. And it, what it does is it actually stops the tree moving. It's it's static, right? It's really, you're putting a big metal metal rod through generally one or two or three or you know more depending on the tree. And, uh, and what it does, it helps it from splitting in storms. Now, lindens, if it's a, if it's a linden, they're really good at compartmentalizing decay. So that's good. Another thing is, what does the environment look like? If you're going to invest money in a, in a bolt, make sure you don't let other parts of the tree fail, right? So you're investing in the structure of the tree, make sure the physiological health of the tree is still adequate. Don't have a tree that's dying back and then spend hundreds of hundreds, if not a thousand or more dollars putting in a, a thread, a threaded rod or a cable, uh, bolt to keep a tree alive that's already on its way out. Similarly, if the tree is decaying, don't fertilize it with nitrogen. I say that again. This is one of the things I want you to, everybody to take home. If a tree is decaying, don't fertilize it with nitrogen. Because if you fertilize it with nitrogen, you're going to advance the decay. If a tree has a fungal pathogen in its leaves, don't fertilize it with nitrogen. You're going to advance that fungal pathogen in the leaves. This is important. Just going back to that other question. And when we're talking about you've got a threaded rod or you've got a, a, a bolt that you're putting through that tree, you want to make sure that that tree is as healthy as possible so that it can recover from that surgery. Just like if you had a dog and that dog needed to get its leg taken off because that leg had cancer. You're going to take care of that. If you're going to spend a thousand or more dollars on your dog, you're going to take care of the dog, hopefully, right? Don't do that and then not put a cone on its head and let it lick its wound and then make it worse. Then you have to take it back to the vet, spend even more money. Right. It's the same if you're going to put a, a, a bolt in a tree, don't put a bolt in a tree and then do all this construction and damage the tree or don't water it when it's a dry summer. Don't mulch it like make sure you do all the right things. If you're getting the threaded rod, make sure you have a plan, make sure your arborist has a plan. And this is the big thing. Make sure it's an arborist putting that on, because if you have a threaded rod installed by somebody who doesn't know what they're doing, it might be legal. But the insurance company, they're going to have questions. Right. And the question is going to be, who did you have install it? And did they know what they were doing? So there's uh, there's some food for thought on that. Uh, really, uh, really great questions today, everybody. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much, Kel. It is my pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us today. And we do have just a few um, slides to cover some Burlington Green content. So I'll ask Amy. Um, if she is able 
um, to use options of view, or maybe before, uh, before yes. I jump up here, Kale, if I could just say, just to put it out there for everybody, there's information on get involved, uh, community connectors and tree talks. So this is something that we're doing on the forest planning and health side of things, just to, to kind of answer people's questions before they become uh, big questions or before they become an information request or a service request. Uh, we don't have a lot of availability for this program, but we're trying to grow it and we, we can grow it with your interest. So if you want to check the community connectors out, uh, we're working with recreation, community and culture to do these walks uh, where they happen during the day, during the week. Uh, but we, the idea is we go around with residents um, in their neighborhoods with their neighbors and we talk about the forestry and the urban forestry in your neighborhood. So why are we planting certain trees? What are some invasive species we have to worry about? And uh, and I just wanted to encourage everybody if, they, if they're if they interested to go check out those links. Uh, it would be really nice to uh, to see out there. Uh, thanks again, Kale. Thank you so much, Kyle. And if you don't mind, if you could stop sharing the screen so Amy's will pop up. Sure. And I'll very briefly share uh, some of our other opportunities that are coming up. And I'll just pop in advance here our um, our survey link that I will mention uh, in a moment. But yeah, so we have, uh, A, just thank you so much to everyone for attending today, and especially to Kyle, obviously, who was so kind to share. Um, I'm sure we're all blown away, and I think what happens every single time is no matter how much time we have to get information, we always recognize, like, wow, so we could be doing this for, like, 10 hours a day for the next few weeks, and I feel like Kyle would still have so much knowledge to share. So just thank you for all of the work it has taken to accumulate all of that knowledge and your willingness to share it all with us. And uh, just if you can see on the screen here, we only have a, a couple minutes left and want to respect everyone's time. But I did put the survey link in the chat there. And some of our upcoming opportunities, you'll see probably the most, I don't want to say important, but the most time sensitive one is this Saturday, we're actually having our tree loving care event at Millcroft Park, uh, which is obviously very, very related to what we were talking about today. We're going to be doing a tree inventory, which is of the, uh, we've done two separate plantings of 500 trees up at Millcroft Park. And uh, like we've learned over the years, and like we've talked about so much today, that it's not just about putting the plants in the ground, but it's also about caring for them and giving them that TLC that they need to grow healthy, big and strong. Um, so it's a great educational event where you'll learn so much, but we'll also have some hands on components of some different things that we can do. We have our tree photo contest, which is now live and it's celebrating Burlington trees. You can take a picture on uh, most people's phones now have cameras, whatever sort of device you'd like, but it's all about celebrating our Burlington trees. And um, we have a voting thing at the end. And then the, uh, the top winner, uh, the top photo gets a $50 Con and Nurse uh, gift card. We have an Action on Climate event on October 1st, which you can find more information on our website. We're doing a beach cleanup, uh, specifically looking for nurbles on October 7th. We have our very popular zero waste drop off event uh, coming up on October 21st, which is also paired with a repair cafe. So you can both drop off your e-waste as well as take stuff into the repair cafe to maybe get a little bit of fixing done there to save it from the landfill or save it from recycling. Our youth network is running all year. Uh, we have a future focus survey right now. So Burlington Green is doing our five-year strategic plan. Um, and we're looking ahead to what the next five years will look like for Burlington Green. And we would just love and super appreciate your feedback. If you're here, you're somewhat familiar with Burlington Green. And we just want to know from the public um, what the hot pressing issues are to you. So that can really help to shape our direction for the next five years. And then, of course, our Clean Up Green Up runs until the end of October. So if you're not already on our newsletter, it's available right on burlingtongreen.org. And um, we only send out about one email a month. And it's just uh, the high level, what can you do to help the environment here locally? Um, so we appreciate all of you. I did share the chat, the question pro feedback survey. So your survey is very much appreciate appreciated. And I would say with all times we ever ask for feedback, including the future focus, uh, as direct honesty as we as we can handle, we, we would love it um, because we really genuinely always want to make our programs better and our offerings better and be the most effective, impactful organization we can. So please, if you ever have any suggestions, the surveys are there for a reason. Please let us know. 
uh, but you can volunteer with us. Uh, you can follow us on our different social media platforms. It's our 15 year anniversary. We're trying to get to 15,000 followers across all of our platforms. So if you go right to our website, there's all the links to the different websites, uh, whether that's Instagram, Twitter, um, uh, LinkedIn, YouTube, whatever, please subscribe to us. And even if you can just share the posts from our events to let your friends and your family and your colleagues know, um, the more people involved, obviously, the better for the earth. Donate, please. We are a charity um, and we really put every dollar, every penny that we get uh, right into the hard work that we do as an organization. I mentioned our newsletter and just a thank you. Um, this is a bird friendly, a, a nature friendly Burlington event. Uh, that is also supported by Maple View Mall. And yeah, Nature Friendly Burlington is all about making connections between local uh, nature and people stronger, um, which is part of what this event is about, um, making those connections. So again, I just want to say thank you so much. We will have um, eventually, i assuming probably maybe next week, the, the video will be up on YouTube. Uh, so you can share it, you can rewatch it, you can um, uh, spread the information to friends and make everybody just jealous they weren't here live so they could get their questions answered. But uh, survey, much appreciated, please, all those things. And thank you so much, everyone, for joining us this evening.